Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Brian Cordes. Brian is the National Programs Director for Neighborhood Cats, and he's a very good friend of mine. He's also been on our show a couple of times. He's been on episode number 13, if you can believe that, way, way back at episode number 13. And he's also on episode 127, and this is episode 218. So, Brian, welcome back. Oh, thank you, Stacey. It's great to be back, and congratulations on the success of your podcast. Oh, well, thank you, and thank you for your help in in joining in. It's great to be able to catch up with friends, talk to new people, make new friends. I just really enjoy the show, and and thanks to all the listeners for tuning in and and listening to us. For folks that might be interested, we get about 500 to 1,000 people listening to each show, and so it's a really nice number. It's great exposure, but do please continue to share the show with others and spread the word. The more that we share, the better off we'll be for our community cats. So we really appreciate it. So Brian, I'd just like to first catch up with you, find out how things are going in Hawaii with neighborhood cats. Well, things are going great here on the island of Maui, which is where we've uh, settled and kind of set up shop for um, another on-the-ground program. And it's kind of um, kind of a throwback to when I first started doing this work like 17 years ago, which is I'm out there trapping cats and uh, working directly with people and kind of having all those, those fascinating on-the-ground experiences that you have when you're dealing directly with the cats. And part of that is because... We're partnering with the Maui Humane Society, which is the the one major shelter on the island. And they've just, uh, in the last couple of years, have moved in just this very progressive direction. They're doing high volume spay neuter. Uh, they're focused on community cats. Uh, we just recently partnered with them to build a special kind of TNR room at the shelter. And it's just, uh, it's an exciting time when we've got you know, this real turnaround happening in what has traditionally been a really massive cat overpopulation situation. So um, when you're talking about working with the Maui Humane Society, and I know you've been such an incredible advocate about targeted spay and neuter, are you approaching the island of Maui sort of in the same way with, with targeted projects? Or are you just sort of trying to blitzkrieg the whole island? Well, um, they, the Maui Humane Society did quite a blitzkrieg before we arrived. They did, they had mash these kind of field hospital spay neuter clinics set up in the parking lot of the shelter. They did that for a couple of years and altered altogether, uh, 6,000 cats and dogs, mostly cats. And they did that by going to the largest colonies on the island. And some of them were as large as 200 cats. And by the time we got here, those kinds of situations have largely been addressed, the really uh, massive ones spread around the island. So now it's a matter of getting into the neighborhoods and getting into the community and getting more involvement, hands-on involvement with people. So that's kind of what we're focused on. We're not doing strictly targeting in terms of like, we haven't gotten to a point where we're saying, okay, this particular neighborhood is the res- responsible for the most intake. So let's just flood that neighborhood and spend the next six months there. And we're doing that a little bit. Like there's one town up on the west side, Lahaina, which is a, a quite a you know relatively long distance from the shelter. So it's been kind of, uh, hasn't gotten a lot of the services in the past because it's a, a longer drive. So whenever we have uh, calls from up there, we we prioritize them. So most of the work we've been doing has been in Lahaina, but we haven't done real hardcore, like only working there. And part of that is because, you know, you, you, you want to set the stage for that kind of intensive targeting. And before you can do that, you need to have TNR accepted in the community as a whole. And you need to have services in place so that people who want to do this work and are not in your target area have a path that they can follow 
where they can go and get the cats fixed. So we're pretty close, I think, as a community to getting to that point. And I would expect within the next six months to a year, we will be doing intensive targeting. But at this stage where TNR is, is, is so new, relatively, it's only been a couple of years, I'm afraid that we might set ourselves back if we were just saying no to people who called because they weren't in a particular area. And so you're talking about Hawaii accepting TNR, but there have been some folks that have been very anti-TNR. Do you want to just sort of describe what seems to have gone on within, you know, in Hawaii over the last six to 12 months? Well, you know, to, I think to understand that, you have to look at what's been going on over the last 20 years. And Hawaii is home to uh, probably the largest concentration of endangered bird species uh, in the country and, and in some ways in the world because the fauna developed here in such isolation. You know, Hawaii, I think, is the most isolated island chain in the world. So you have a lot of really unique species here and mostly due to to us and and destruction of habitat and global warming and all those things we we've been doing as a society these birds are in a lot of trouble but what's happened here is the conservation community has really focused on cats as as the biggest problem or the one that requires the most attention and they're pouring you know, millions of dollars into projects to uh, fence or uh, try to eradicate or things like that. And what's happened is, you know, this, this bird, this kind of what I think is a false debate of cats versus birds, because you can help both at the same time. But that debate, uh, which, you know, the rest of the country has seen largely fade, uh, not entirely, but largely fade away as more and more communities embrace trap neuter return here in Hawaii, it's, it's almost like this is their last stand and it's really taken hold in the conservation community. And what's happening is they're looking at Australia, which a couple of years ago started a, uh, a government funded campaign to eradicate 2 million feral cats from the landscape. And I don't, I don't think that program is successful by any metric in, in terms of either reaching their goal uh, of absolute numbers or actually having an impact on the population or protecting any endangered species there. But they are, as a nation, as anti-cat as you could possibly be. And what's happening is the Hawaii conservation community is looking over to Australia and they're saying, we like that and we want to see that here and they see Hawaii as a gateway to the rest of the United States. And if they can eradicate cats here and show that that works, they think that they can kind of spark a national movement that would wipe away trap new to return programs and turn the public against the cats and start to permanently erase them from the landscape. And I know that sounds really fanciful, but that's, that's what they believe. And here in Hawaii, because it's isolated and the animal welfare community in the past has been very divided, and up until a couple of years ago, the directors of the major shelters were all very traditional, all very high euthanasia rates and very comfortable with that. They, I think they felt like this was their best shot at it. So you see um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you see the state. Department of Land and Natural Resources, American Bird Conservancy, NOAA, the National um, Oceanic Administration. I only know them by their, I, I don't know their full name, but they're all banding together to um, run this virulent anti-cat campaign. And in fact, that was one of the reasons that uh, drew us to put our stake in the ground here because uh, we don't want them succeeding. Uh, we know they won't succeed in terms of wiping out the cats, but we don't want them killing hundreds of thousands of cats or trying to and setting a really terrible precedent. Uh, we want this to be their last stand uh, so that they really don't try this anymore. But it's a it's a it's quite the fight. You've you've got a disorganized animal welfare community, but which is coming starting to come together more. And the the most recent controversy, which really brings this into focus has been um, 
the Division of Land and Natural Resources, the State Wildlife Agency, manages all the small boat harbors in the state. And there are 44 of them. And as anybody who has worked with cats around harbors knows, well, you you know, who uses harbors? Mostly fishermen or um, sports uh, sportsmen who are out fishing. And you have tons of uh, food and you have tons of rodents. And well, guess what? You also have tons of cats. And the um, state wildlife agency has passed uh, internally. They've approved rules that would um, make it illegal to feed cats at the harbors. Uh, that would uh, charge anybody who's doing TNR at harbors with uh, abandonment as a as a crime. And which in um, uh, eventually in a year's time, if there are still cats there, would allow them to, uh, by statute, to use uh, the phrases by any means necessary to remove these cats. And uh, there's uh, pretty good information. They use that authority, which we think is inappropriately uh, being applied here. It's authority they have in wildlife preserves to shoot or poison or use the most egregious traps or whatever they need to do to kill uh, domestic animals that are in wildlife preserves. And uh, they, uh, you know, our belief is that if this authority comes into effect, they will start a shooting campaign at the small boat harbors, which, which sounds crazy, right? I mean, we're, we're not talking about isolated wildlife areas where it would be bad enough. We're talking about um, here on Maui, there's a small boat harbor at Malalea, which is surrounded by condominium complexes. You, you walk out your front door and you're in the boat harbor and they want to start shooting animals. Yeah, that's crazy. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. And it's not just cats. It's any animal that wanders onto the premises. Even if that animal is owned, they have are giving themselves the authority to immediately shoot that animal. They don't have to make any effort to find the owner. They don't have to bring the animal to a shelter so, um, as you can imagine, the animal welfare community here is quite up in arms about that and it is campaigning to persuade the governor, Governor Ige, uh, not to sign these rules and not to have this uh, come into effect. So that's quite quite the fight that's going on right now. And do you have any sense of the the leaning? It's It sounds like they have a very strong faction, but if you're saying they can shoot anything, I mean, I'm just envisioning somebody walking their dog or something that like, and the dog is off leash, which is not supposed to happen, but people walk their dogs off leash. And, you know, what if some, they shoot somebody's dog? Well, I don't know that that's their plan, but these rules give them, they give them that authority. It seems pretty clear the plan is to kill the cats, however they, they can. But they do have the authority under the, if these rules are approved to do exactly what you just described, which is so, somebody's pet can come running out the door and it's, uh, you know, if they come across the wrong wildlife agency officer, they could be dead. And it's, you know, we know as a, as a TNR and an animal welfare community that trying to eradicate cats from the landscape doesn't work. And all we have to do is look at the 50 or 60 or 70 years that preceded spay neuter campaigns. And we know spay neuter does work because we just have to look at areas like the northeast of the country or the northwest, an increasing number of areas that actually have cat shortages because of the intensive amount of spay neuter, including TNR, that they've done. So you can be uh, uh, wanting to protect uh, endangered species and look at that and say, all right, let me go the other direction. We've tried to kill all the cats. It hasn't worked. Let me try something new. Instead, in Hawaii, the conservation community looks at that and they say, well, they didn't kill enough of them and they weren't hard line enough. And if we just take it to the extreme and do everything we physically possibly can to wipe out these cats, we can succeed. And they'll just constantly be proven wrong over and over again, but they'll inflict a tremendous amount of suffering in the meantime, and they'll continue to impede progress on the spay-neuter front. Popcats, the celebration of cats meet pop culture. 
will make its electrifying debut in Miami Saturday, October 28, 2017, at the Miami Airport Convention Center. The curated show will feature a ridiculously adorable cat lounge, visual artists, inspiring speakers, art installations, and the makers of the most innovative products of the cat universe. PopCat's core mission is to raise awareness about cat welfare efforts by crafting an experience that mixes entertainment with advocacy. A portion of proceeds will benefit the Cat Network, a cat-centric not-for-profit organization with over 20 years of service in South Florida. The convention will welcome an invasion of cat lovers, curious spectators, and pop culture fans to a scene flooded with music and immersive art installations specifically designed to ignite shareable memories. The exhibition floor will also grant visitors the unique opportunity to meet national and international talent that have grasped the fascination of the internet community. Highlights amongst the speakers are fervent rescuer tumblers meme librarian Amanda Brennan, Lorenzo the Cat photographer Joanne Biondi, and Shark Tank presenter and Apollo's Peak Pet Beverages founder Brandon Zavala. A giant bubble cat lounge will also be a can't miss feature at PopCats, where attendees will be able to interact freely with an irresistible herd of adoptable cats brought by the Cat Network. For more information and tickets, please go to www.popcatsshow.com. Are you swamped with miscellaneous papers and notebooks with details about the cats in your colonies? It's hard to keep track of all the details. Do you get a headache whenever your TNR coordinator asks you for paperwork that they need for their program? Cat Stats is the ultimate TNR program management tool that will reduce your stress. Set up your own online cat colony database and track colonies and caretakers in your service area. Mapping and automated requests for help are also featured. Designed by Neighborhood Cats, Cat Stats is available at no cost to animal welfare organizations. CatStats has an easy-to-use interface, and all of the information is protected and private. We want to help you spend less time on paperwork and more time helping cats. Check out this free tool at catstats.org, C-A-T-S-T-A-T-S dot O-R-G, brought to you by Neighborhood Cats. So if there are folks or if our listeners who may be not in Hawaii, but who are interested in following the story of, of what's happening out there. Does your website have information on how this is all shaking out? Yes, we do have um, information on the homepage uh, at this time about the campaign. And we'll certainly post whatever uh, the results are. And even if the governor does sign it, that's not the end of the road. And I would also point out, especially for Hawaii residents, this is uh, an effort that's been joined by the Humane Society of the United States, uh, Best Friends Animal Society, and Alley Cat Allies. And they all have information, too, about what's going on and how people can help. I want to take a little step back for our trappers who are listening to the show. Um, you had mentioned that the Maui Humane Society had installed or had created a TNR room. Can you describe what that is? Sure. It's a, it's a place to leave the cats after you've trapped them. So what we would do uh, typically is we like to do mass trapping. So we try to catch the whole colony at the same time. So we may go out and end up with 12, 15, 25 cats. And what this holding space allows us to do is we go to the shelter. We we put them in this, you know, very airy ceiling fan, you know, beautiful large space. We can fill out all the paperwork that the clinic needs, and then we uh, put them on racks. And the holding space is a short walk to the spay neuter clinic. So the staff, the clinic staff, comes in in the morning, and all they have to do is open the door, wheel out the cats, and put them right into the clinic. So it makes the whole process very efficient, and. Funny enough, Maui is similar in some respects to our old haunts in Manhattan where uh, people don't have garages, they don't have basements, they don't have a place to put the cats while they're trapping them. And in Maui, a lot of people uh, live in condominiums or there aren't basements, there aren't a lot of basements uh, or garages. So it's been a real obstacle for people who want to do more than a few cats at a time just to have a place to put them. And this uh, holding space will solve that problem. That's great. That's great. I think it's very helpful. And I think that 
you know, if a, a larger organization or a, a traditional shelter like a humane society in the community, you know, wants to help facilitate more TNR in their community, that concept of a TNR room, I think is, it really makes a lot of practical sense. Well, it really does. And, and, you know, it's the, it's locked, it's a locked, secure facility. And what the shelter is able to do is uh, give the code or give the key uh, to, uh, you know, trusted trappers, people that they have a longstanding relationship with who they, you know, um, are fine with coming in and, and bringing cats and leaving them there overnight. And it just makes the whole process much easier. And an interesting thing, I think that we hope will start to develop more in the community, in the animal welfare field is that when organizations are building new shelters or building new facilities, that they start to incorporate this kind of space into the design because where you put it and how wide you make the door and uh, things like that can greatly facilitate, you know, the speed at which the clinic is able to get the cats in. Yeah, no, that's that's really a smart, smart thought. And the design of shelters going forward, I think, is going to change dramatically over time as our populations change and the needs of the community change, that kind of thing. Uh, Brian, any updates, quick updates that you might have um, from Neighborhood Cats from your work in New York City? Well, uh, this this weekend, we will be training our 7,000th um, New York City resident huh. and caretaker on how to do trap neuter return. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a real milestone. And we're very proud of um, New York City and, and the uh, New York City Shelter Animal Care Centers. They've been achieving, I'm not sure exactly what the figures are right now, but it's it's somewhere in the 85 to 95 percent live release rate for cats. And, you know, we're really happy to have played a part of that and, and to have really launched this full grass movement where just thousands and thousands of, the, of these cats are being fixed every year. I mean, there's still plenty of challenges ahead, but we've come so far uh, from when we started when it was really the reverse numbers were true. And we just recently completed a, um, an, an intensively uh, targeted project in uh, Jersey City, which is right across the river from, from New York. And uh, we fixed a thousand cats in, uh, well, actually we fixed about 800 cats in one zip code and then we couldn't find any more. Uh, so then we moved to the uh, zip code next door and the local shelter Liberty Humane Society has reported uh, fewer cats, fewer complaints uh, from these targeted areas. So, uh, you know, that is an example of an intensive uh, that ultimately we we like to see TNR programs evolving to the point uh, where they are doing that kind of um, really concentrated effort in high need areas, which is where we'll get to in Maui um, before long. That's great. Well, by having a high volume clinic on the island, is it's just a huge change and it, it will make a great difference, you know, over the next couple of years. So if folks are interested, I, I looked at your website and it looked like you were going to be doing a bit of traveling over the course of the fall, as well as um, you are doing a webinar, I think, in October. Would you like to share with us, you know, what, where you might be? come the middle to the end of October and into November, if you have any plans for the, for 2017? Um, oh yeah. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, doing presentations as part of uh, the Rethinking the Cat Symposium, which is produced by the Humane Society of the United States. And just last week we did uh, a conference in Honolulu. And these, uh, these conferences are one day events that bring together some of the leading experts in the country on cat issues, on both the community cat and the shelter uh, adoption cat tracks. And I do presentations on community-wide TNR programs as part of that. You can find information about them on uh, animalsheltering.org. And let's see, I'll be in, we're doing a four-day, like it's, it's just as close as I'll ever be to uh, feeling like I'm in a rock band. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're going to be in uh, Topeka, Kansas on October 3rd, Wichita, Kansas on October 4th, Oklahoma City in Oklahoma on, on October 5th, and then ending up in Tulsa, Oklahoma on October 6th. So that's going to be quite the uh, whirlwind 
Uh, lots of good information, you know, for our friends in the Midwest. And then on October 17th, I'll be doing a webinar uh, that will be produced by, again, by the Humane Society of the United States. And it's going to be based, uh, based, I think the title will be uh, Combating the Naysayers, Who Says There's No Proof TNR Works. And it, uh, basically, I'll be going over the latest research in the field and showing that, you know, contrary to the uh, uh, constant uh, refrain that you hear from anti-TNR people that, well, there's no proof TNR works, there's, there's a ton of proof that TNR works. And I'll be going over that in uh, some detail. So that'll be October 17th. And again, go to uh, animalsheltering.org uh, to look for uh, how to register. That's great. And before we, we sign off, I wanted to just touch base with you. One of our shows, we really took a deep dive in cat stats. Um, do you have any new news or anything that has changed over the course of the year in working with uh, other organizations and helping develop their, their cat stat modules? <laughs> Uh, Cat Stats is an online colony registration system, which allows TNR programs to uh, have a place where uh, information on colony data and caretaker contact, contact information can all be stored in a convenient online uh, place. And then uh, the program uh, provides mapping and all sorts of other tools to help manage the program. And since we launched that I, about a year ago, I guess, there we have over 100 groups that are now signed up. And what we're finding is the groups that really take advantage of this software are, are doing some amazing things. Uh, we see them creating maps of their work to present to community leaders like legislators uh, in order to get funding, in order to uh, promote pro-TNR policies. We see all sorts of tracking of the activity in the community, which didn't exist before. So it's really been, I think, a great tool for a lot of communities. What we're also seeing is that not everybody's a, a techie. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and as much as we've designed this to be as user-friendly as possible, there, there are a few hours of work involved. And I would just encourage organizations that are interested in this to, uh, to go to catstats.org. That's uh, C-A-T-S-T-A-T-S dot O-R-G. Uh, go ahead and register and then uh, give us a call. We're more than happy to help people set this up and get it, get it running. Um, I think there's been a hesitancy to reach out uh, on the part of some groups for assistance and it's kind of slowed their use of the tool. So I, so I think it's worked out quite well, but we would like to see it used more and uh, we'd like to see people use us more uh, to help them get going. Yeah, it's it, it really can be very a very helpful tool. And I think still there are folks that maybe haven't even heard about it. So the more we can get the word out about it. But yeah, you do have to make a commitment to either uploading information from wherever you've gathered it, you know, in your Excel spreadsheet or or, you know, in another database. But it's definitely worth it because it has it has so many fantastic layers where it will help you work more efficiently. Um, if folks are interested in uh, finding out more from you, uh, asking questions, how would they do that? Well, they can always reach me personally at uh, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at neighborhoodcats.org, or just go to our website, you know, www.neighborhoodcats.org, and uh, click on contact. We have a lot of great information about TNR on the website, so you can go there too. It's a pretty new web. It's a new website, isn't it? Pretty new. Uh, yeah, the design is uh, just, uh, I think, a year and a half old. So uh, we've had a website for a long time, but this this is uh, we're now in the modern age. It's mobile friendly and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's um, an e easy navigation, we hope. Um, it is it is pretty popular. We get, you know, somewhere in the range of 800 to 1,000 people a day uh, visiting. That's great. So, Brian, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think what I would share based on, on my last year here in Hawaii is uh, 
to understand, you know, I know uh, people often feel isolated doing this work, like you're alone out there trapping, or maybe you're still dealing with um, critics and things like that. And uh, the thing to understand is that every time you do this work, every time you fix a cat, and every time you stabilize a colony, you're having an impact way beyond your immediate situation. And there's still a fight going on in this country. Uh, we're winning most of the battles, but the fight is not over. And every time you do something that shows success, uh, you're helping all of us. What a great way to end the show. Brian, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on the show today. And I really hope you're willing to come on again in the future. Oh, always. Thank you. The Community Cats podcast will soon be a year old with over 200 episodes profiling amazing people who are all making a difference in the lives of community cats. If you would like to support the show but not be a sponsor, feel free to contribute to our efforts by going to www.communitycatspodcast.com and follow the donate link. Help us to continue to provide excellent programming. 